Before we use NQTT to publish and subscribe, we must connect to the NQTT server first. The NQTT connection can be divided into two steps. First, establishing the connection for the underlying transport protocol, and then establishing the MQTT connection. Currently, the commonly used transport protocols for MQTT are TCP, TLS, and WebSocket. TLS is often used to enhance communication security, and WebSocket is typically used to develop MQTT web applications. These three transport protocols have covered the majority of use cases. Of course, NQTT does not limit the transport protocols that can be used. Any protocol that can provide ordered, lossless, bidirectional transmission of byte streams can be used as the transport protocol for NQTT, such as QUIC. We can initiate the NQTT connection only after completing the underlying transport protocol connection. Establishing an NQTT connection requires two packets, the connect and the connect act packets. The client uses the connect packet to send a connection request, and the server uses the connect act packet to return the result. Many parameters we set when using the NQTT client library or tool to initiate a connection to the NQTT server are fields or properties in the connect packet, such as client ID, username, password, and so on. In NQTT, client ID is crucial, it is used to identify the client connected to the NQTT server uniquely. One of its essential roles is to associate with the session state. If the client indicates that it wants to reuse the previous session when connecting, the specified client ID will be used by the MQTT server to find the corresponding session state to resume communication with the client from the correct session state. In addition to the session state required by the protocol, the server usually also stores information such as when the client comes online, when it goes offline, its IP address, and the number of messages sent and received. The information of different clients depends on the unique identifier of client ID to distinguish. In most cases, the client ID is specified by the client, but for some clients, it is difficult to ensure that they will not use duplicate client ID with each other. So MQTT allows the client to specify a client ID with a length of zero when connecting, and the server will assign a globally unique client ID and return it to the client via the connect act packet. If the client wants to reuse the session in subsequent connections, it should continue to use the client ID assigned by the server when connecting. Of course, if the client does not need to reuse the session, it can request the server to assign a new client ID again. It's important to note that since NQTT 3.1.1 does not support returning the client ID assigned by the server in the connect act packet, the client must ask the server to assign a new client ID every time it connects. So if we use this feature in NQTT 3.1.1, we will not be able to reuse sessions between multiple connections. In addition to client ID, we often need to set username and password for the client. The server will use these two fields to verify the client's identity and grant corresponding permissions to the client. This will determine whether the client can log in and which topics it can subscribe to to publish. The most common is password-based authentication, that is, the server looks up the hash password in the database according to the username provided by the client and then performs the same hash on the password sent by the client and then compares the two hashes. If they match, it means that the client has the correct password and can be allowed to access, otherwise the client will be denied access. Using a duplicate client ID for a connection would result in the closure of the existing client connection and the new client connection would take over its session state. Therefore, in some authentication schemes, the client ID is also used for authentication, which is usually to check whether the user has the right to use this client ID. This can prevent attackers from launching attacks on all client connections with a leaked pair of username and password. Furthermore, when we use NQTT over TCP to connect, all data will be transmitted in plain text, including the password. This will bring certain security risks, so we recommend that authentication and TLS be enabled simultaneously to protect our communication data. If the MQTT server does not enable authentication or authorization services, the client can connect directly without specifying these two fields. They are optional in the connect packet. In some clients that support multiple MQTT protocol versions, we may need to specify the desired MQTT protocol version. 
This is actually setting the protocol version in the connect packet. The protocol version can take three values, three, four, and five. Among them, three represents that the NQTT protocol version used by the client is NQTT 3.1, four represents NQTT 3.1.1, and five represents NQTT 5.0. Servers that support multiple MQTT protocol versions need to determine how to parse the following packet content based on the value of this field. And servers that have not yet provided support for all protocol versions need to judge whether they support the protocol currently used by the client based on this field. Therefore, the protocol version field is mandatory in the connect packet. In real-world scenarios, we may encounter situations where clients don't actively close the connection due to unexpected power outages, crashes, and so on, leaving unaware servers to consume system resources in maintaining these zombie connections. Alternatively, the network has been interrupted, but the client and server cannot discover and re-establish the connection in time because there is no data exchange between them, thereby impacting subsequent message transmission. To address this issue, NQTT provides a keep alive mechanism to help clients and servers quickly detect network anomalies. The client needs to set its own keep alive when connecting, indicating that the interval between sending packets to the server will not exceed the value of keep alive. If the server does not receive any packet within one and a half times the keep alive duration, it will consider the client inactive and disconnect. In NQTT 5.0, if the server is not willing to accept the keep alive given by the client, for example, the keep alive given by the client is too large, then the server can return its desired keep alive value through the server keep alive property in the connect act packet. In this case, the client must accept this keep alive value because the server will use it to determine the connection's activity status. If the client does not have any other packets to send within a keep alive period, it can send a ping request packet as a heartbeat to indicate that the connection is alive and well. Alternatively, a more straightforward approach is to send ping request packets at fixed intervals. Although this may waste some bandwidth, the ping request packet is small, requiring only two bytes, so it is generally within an acceptable range. For each received ping request packet, the server will respond with a ping response packet. If the client sends a ping request packet and does not receive the ping response packet for a prolonged period, it can assume that the network is unavailable or the server is not active and then disconnect. The protocol does not specify how long the client should wait. The client can determine the appropriate duration based on the actual network conditions. These are just a few commonly used NQTT connection parameters. The remaining fields or properties in the connect packet are usually related to a specific NQTT feature, such as session, will message, and so on. We will cover them in detail in subsequent lessons. After the server receives the connect packet sent by the client, it will confirm whether it supports the protocol version used by the client, parse the complete packet content, and verify the client's identity. After a series of operations, the server will return a connect act packet, and the reason code in the packet will indicate to the client whether the connection is successful or the reason for the connection failure. Most client tools or libraries will return the reason code to the upper layer so that we can locate the reason of the connection failure based on the reason code. Common failure reasons include invalid packet, bad username or password, and so on. If the reason code in the connect act packet received by the client is less than 128, it means that we have successfully connected and now we can perform subsequent publish and subscribe operations.